Welcome to the Radiology Vault, an open repository for radiology educational content designed for learners and medical professionals. Presented by the Michigan Medicine Department of Radiology. Welcome, my name is John Kim and I'm an Associate Professor of Radiology here at University of Michigan. Today we're going to be talking about perfusion MRI. So the objectives and goals of this talk is to provide some overview of the three major MR perfusion techniques that we use in neuro. Uh, hopefully you can recognize the pros and cons of each technique and understand the utility and clinical applications of each perfusion technique in neuroimaging. So we're going to talk about DSC, DCE, ASL, some pros and cons of each, and then we'll go into some cases discussing the clinical applications for each of these techniques. So perfusion MRI or perfusion weighted imaging helps define vascularity such as blood volume or blood flow. And perfusion imaging can be performed in a few different ways. Uh, you can give gadolinium contrast and perform something called dynamic susceptibility contrast or DSC, uh, which is a T2 star gradient uh, technique. Or you could try dynamic contrast enhanced DCE or T1 weighted SPGR technique. Uh, these are two well-established um, perfusion techniques. However, there's a newer um, technique that does not use gadolinium contrast uh, called arterial spin labeling or ASL. Some of the pros of DSE imaging is that it is very useful in brain tumor imaging and sometimes in stroke. However, the cons is that it creates a lot of artifacts, especially near blood vessels, in air and soft tissue and bone interfaces, calcifications and large hematomas. It does require gadolinium contrast and the use of a power injector and needs post-processing software. DC is the same where it requires gadolinium and also needs post-processing software. However, it is very high in resolution and it can be utilized in brain, head and neck and spine or multiple body parts. ASL does not require gadolinium contrast or IV access does not require post-processing software and is easy to repeat if necessary because it does not require reinjection of gadolinium. However, the cons of ASL is that it is not available on all scanners and it cannot be performed on spine imaging. Dynamic susceptibility contrast perfusion is a T2 star effect uh, technique. This is uh, performed with gadolinium injection and as gadolinium goes into the vascular mass or lesion, it causes a dip in signal as the gadolinium uh, contrast and ions uh, dephase. And as the tumor, if it's very vascular, it causes more and more dephasing and signal loss. And that is what we estimate to be the relative cerebral blood volume. DSC provides information on the relative cerebral blood volume. And here is the formula where you get the CBV equals CBF or cerebral blood volume times the mean transit time MTT. In brain tumor imaging, conventional imaging may only show some nodule here after a left temporal lobe mass resection that occurred five months after the surgery. And as you can see right here, this nodular enhancement was not there before, maybe a little tiny punctative enhancement was there five months prior. And in conventional imaging, it may be very difficult to tell whether this truly is a recurrent or residual lesion or treatment or radiation effect. However, the DSC perfusion imaging shows that same enhancing nodular lesion is showing elevated uh, blood volume, as you can see right here in the red. And this was taken out by surgery and after pathology reviewed it, it turned out to be recurrent or residual glioblastoma. And the perfusion was very helpful in assisting in the diagnosis before the surgery. This is another young patient who had a right frontal diffuse astrocytoma that was nicely resected by the neurosurgeon. Three months after radiation therapy, there was a new lesion that was seen in the right periventricular white matter, as you can see right here, that shows some post-contrast enhancement. On conventional imaging, it will be difficult to tell whether this is recurrent or residual tumor. However, on the DSC perfusion, that same area of nodular enhancement shows to have decreased or low perfusion, and this was consistent to be radiation effect. We followed this patient for many years, and three years later, that same area appears to have decreased in size, and this confirmed to be most likely some form of probable radiation necrosis or radiation effect after the initial resection. 
Now, dynamic contrast enhanced perfusion, or DCE, is a T1 weighted imaging technique where you utilize gadolinium contrast to create a T1 shortening effect within the mass or vascular lesion. Oftentimes, tumors have a lot of intravascular perfusion, and the gadolinium causes this T1 shortening. And basically, you inject gadolinium contrast at 2 to 4 milliliters per second utilizing uh, a dynamic T1 weighted SPGR technique and you obtain these quantifiable measurements called K-trans, VP, and VE. With DCE perfusion, we can obtain this uh, measurement called VP or fractional blood plasma or intravascular volume uh, which estimates the tumor vascularity. Also we can obtain K-trans, which is basically the estimation of vessel permeability. Now you can see right here we're obtaining a perfusion imaging of the lumbar spine in rapid acquisition, and you can see the K-trans map, a post-process map showing two lesions right here in the spine, uh, which has also increased VP uh, on the VP map, which is consistent with a very vascular tumor. Now, a normal blood vessel does not have much leakage and it does not go outside the extracellular space, outside of the normal vasculature space, outside of the normal vasculature. So there'll be minimal K-trans and minimal VP in normal soft tissue and marrow um, as the red blood cells traverse. However, in tumors, uh, there's a lot of vascularity, neovascularity, so there's going to be a lot of vascular you know, perfusion to these uh, tumors and can cause also leakage. So there's going to be high VP and high K-trans oftentimes. As you can see right here. So this is an example of a patient with a brain uh, lesion that was turned out to be papillary thyroid cancer METS. And you can see that this lesion that is enhancing, and showing also some edema, is very high on K-trans, VP, and also VE, but basically uh, showing elevated uh, permeability and uh, vascularity. Four months after radiation therapy, you can see that this lesion on the post-contrast imaging shows increase in size and also significant surrounding edema. However, on the perfusion imaging, you can see that the K-trans uh, appears to have also decreased and the VP has dramatically decreased overall, suggesting that the lesion is much, much less vascular. And this is consistent with radiation effect. Now, perfusion imaging can also be performed without contrast, and my favorite technique is called arterial spin labeling. Now, arterial spin labeling can be performed in various ways, the most common being the pseudo-continuous arterial spin labeling technique. Now, how we do this is that we label the arterial blood as it comes from below, uh, from the heart, up toward the brain, as you can imagine. As it's coming up toward the brain, there is a uh, one slice or slab that we take where we label the arterial blood. And as we label it, it goes, uh, it, go, it flips and goes up into the brain. And instead of blood volume, we're actually getting blood flow information. This can be used in brain tumor evaluation, identifying hyperacute stroke or vascular malformations, sometimes in epilepsy. And especially it can be helpful in people who cannot get gadolinium contrast due to some severe allergy or in kids who may have difficult IV access. This is an illustration of how arterial spin labeling may work. As the protons are coming in from below uh, from the heart and goes into the brain, we pick a slice or slab uh, right below. And as the protons are being labeled, it'll flip upside down and then it'll go into the brain. And as it goes in, we take some various images or slices or axial slices of the brain. So I'll show you again some examples here. This is a patient with a history of brain tumor and was allergic to gadolinium. They had an initial brain tumor that was resected here. And immediately post-op, there was a nice resection cavity here and a little bit of like a T2 signal for flare signal. And then a few months later, there was a little bit of more nodularity here seen in the right paracentral lobule. So this patient, there was concern that this new area of nodularity was concerning. And so we did the ASL, as you can see right here, and this area of nodularity turned out to be very elevated in perfusion, as you can see right here. On the left is the initial imaging, where we saw that increased perfusion and increased nodularity. And then two years later, we can see that that same nodular area after treatment has decreased in size with decreased perfusion, consistent with treatment uh, response. 
Now headaches can also present in a lot of patients and sometimes like this child presented with uh, headaches that was causing some right facial droop and difficulty speaking. And we did this uh, again ASL and as you can see right here the left cerebral hemisphere is much decreased compared to the other contralateral hemisphere on the right. And if you can see right here the, even the M MRA was um, you know a little bit unusual it was a little bit decreased in, in overall side on the left MCA territory. And this is showing that there was no restricted diffusion and there was a little bit of high susceptibility in the cortical veins. This is consistent with hemiplegic migraine. And this is a very rare subtype of severe headache that can mimic a stroke. And so it can present, especially in the teen or pre-teenage years, and may cause a lot of anxiety and uh, fear in the patients and their families when they present with these episodes. Treatment is oftentimes supportive management. Brain imaging usually is normal on CT or conventional MRI, but perfusion imaging such as ASL can show unilateral hypo or hyperperfusion, which can clinch the diagnosis. So this is another example of a young 20 year old female who also had some occipital headache with some visual aura. And as you can see, everything else on conventional imaging was normal, but the perfusion images on ASL showed that this area of the left temporal occipital region was elevated in perfusion or flow. And another patient with sickle cell who also has some auras and there was a decreased perfusion in the right occipital lobe and that was probably explaining some of her visual def deficits at that time and this is also probably a hemiplegic migraine. Now ASL can also be used for seizures. There was a young three-year-old who had EEG showing uh, some interictal findings of left posterior dominant irregularities and uh, ASL is showing that area showing increased perfusion or increased blood flow to the left uh, posterior uh, PCA territory. Again, another young child who was two months of age who showed some right posterior quadrant irregularities on EEG. And again, there's a little bit elevated perfusion into that right occipital lobe. And as you can see on uh, T1 weighted, coronal T1 weighted imaging, the brain was very unusual. As you can see, a lot of dysplastic cortices, as you can see right here. Lastly, I want to show you some imaging where we can use ASL for vascular malformations. You can see right here on the right parietal occipital region, there's elevated blood flow compared to the rest of the brain. And SWI shows high susceptibility throughout with lots of T2 flow voids and increased vascular structures on the time of flight MRA, which was consistent with an AVM. This is a patient with right-sided pulsatile tinnitus showing a enhancing lesion in the right parotid gland with increased flow, as you can see on ASL, and also increased vascularity on time of flight MRA and a flow void. And this is also consistent with a right parotid AVM. In conclusion, DSC, DCE, and ASL perfusion is readily available in most newer generation MRI scanners. Perfusion weighted imaging may be very helpful in identifying various CNS diseases where conventional MRI sequences may fall short. ASL also has the benefit of not using gadolinium contrast and is particularly useful in pediatric applications, also in patients with severe GAD allergies or patients with difficult IV sticks. Thank you for your attention. Please email me if you have any questions.